Well, I think I got a yellow sheet put at everybody's place. Or either handed it to you personally. There's some uh, a handout tonight, which is a little bit unusual. For, uh, used to not be on a regular basis uh, since COVID hit. We hadn't given a lot of that type of thing out. But it will help us tonight to... to uh, go through what we're going to go through without me having to wait for you to turn to a lot of the passages is already gives you on that and it's kind of kind of tough to take take notes when I start going a little bit fast I try to try to keep it where you can uh, uh, keep up but uh, just in case not it's always good to have this thing to um, go back and look at too I do this message probably about every five years or so. I think it's been six years since I've done one uh, like this. I'm talking about biblical guidelines for right decisions. And we're going to be basing out of Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 17 tonight. Ephesians 5 and verse number 17. We'll have you turn to Ephesians and if you if you... Keep your place in Ephesians. You're going to be right near just about most of the things that we're going to turn to. Now, there are some exceptions, but uh, if you don't lose track of Ephesians 5, uh, we're, going to be, we're going to be there. Uh, and uh, just a few pages before and afterward for a lot of the message. Biblical guidelines for right decisions. Ephesians 5, verse number 17 tells us, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The Lord has a will for your life, and the Lord has a will for my life, and He wants us to understand what the will, His will, for our lives is. In the matter of understanding and doing the will of God, it is paramount that we be committed to doing the will of God for our lives. I hope that you want to do God's will. You say, well, I want to know what it is before I say whether I'm going to do it or not. That's not the way it works. Okay, uh, We should not ask the question, what shall I do, unless we have first decided that we will do the will of God even before we know what that will is. We must be willing to do God's will whether we like it or not and whether it's or whether or not it seems suitable or expedient in our eyes. It's a matter of trusting the Lord. When the Lord tells you to do something, you trust Him to do it and realize that uh, His will is best for your life. And we must understand that doing the right thing may be very costly sometimes, but doing anything else will uh, ultimately have a higher cost. And uh, we don't want to do that. We're talking about temporal costs versus eternal costs. And we... We uh, want to take a look tonight. Uh, another thing to consider is that we must do the things that we know to be the will of God. You might call that the general will of God. I mean, there's some things that we all know we ought to be doing, right? I mean, we, we know we ought to be faithful to church, right? We know we ought to give. I mean, the things that we know without anybody telling us, we know what the will of God is in some areas. And if, if you're expecting God to reveal to you His will in an area that you do not know, don't expect that if you're not doing the will of God in the area that you do know. Okay, you got to, you got to be uh, actively doing the general will of God that you already know. Why would God tell you any more of His will if you're not doing what you know is His will? Doesn't make sense, does it? There's some things that God requires of us with regard to His will. God requires that we actively yield our will to His. That's a tough call because our will can be strong sometimes. You ever have a strong-willed child? You know, heard of a strong-willed child? Well, sometimes God has some strong-willed children. They want to do their will instead of God's will. God requires that we exercise faith and obedience in response to His leading through the Holy Spirit. You're not going to do the will of God without exercising faith and obedience. God requires that we follow through on the directions that He reveals to us. And once we know God's will, but listen, He expects us to do it. You know, he's, not, he's not into just letting you know what His will is and you decide, well, I don't think I'm going to do that this time. I think I'm going to do something else. That's not, that's not uh, what God is all about. He wants you to know His will and do it. 
we must wholeheartedly respond to implement what is revealed to us of His will. And God requires that we be honest with ourselves and with others. Uh, God's not interested in playing games uh, about His will. So with all that said, how can we determine what is God's will for our lives? I'm kind of going to turn this thing into a Sunday night series a little bit. Okay, We're going to take a look at some areas. I wanted to look at this first. Are there any guidelines that we can use to determine God's will? Are there any clear teachings, as the first question we have, are there any clear teachings about this in the Bible? Because listen, if the Bible addresses it, boom, that's the will of God. <laughs> right? I mean, uh, James 1.22, you're familiar with the, the, what the passage says in James 1.22. It says, but be you doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a, a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. It's like looking in the mirror, seeing something that needs changing, and walking away from the mirror not changing it. Yeah? Some of us are guilty of doing that in the morning time sometimes. Some of that, I think yesterday it was... Uh, I failed to shave, and I knew I needed to shave, and I just walked away from the mirror. And uh, I found out last night that I got I was a little bit scruffy, and uh, I, uh, I I shaved last night and shaved again this morning. So, uh, but you know, we look in the mirror sometimes, and we we see in the mirror of God's word is what we're talking about here. We look in the mirror of God's word, and we behold the things that God wants us to change, and. Uh, we don't uh, do it. That, well, that, that causes a problem. We're, we're, we're a hearer, but we're not a doer. It says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man is blessed in his deed. Now, I don't know about you, but I like the idea of being blessed, don't you? Mm -hmm. And uh, it comes from being obedient to the will of God. The Word of God commands some things and forbids some other things. I mean, just an example of some things commanded. Guys, if you got a wife, the Bible says love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. Tall task, but it's a command. Uh, we're told to love one another. You know, some people are unlovely, but we have to love them anyway. Amen? We, we, we show love. Love one another as... And we, we're to be a witness. We're to, we're to give a good witness to the Lord Jesus Christ, what He's done in our lives to others. Some examples of some things that are forbidden. We know we ought not to gossip. Right? Does anybody have to tell you not to gossip? Or lie? We, we know lying's wrong, right? We know that from Mama. <laughs> Don't you lie to me, boy. <laughs> no, Mama. I wouldn't lie. Oh. Uh, and uh, cheating, uh, we, we know we do not, ought not to gossip, lie, or cheat. Uh, we know that fornication is wrong, adultery is wrong, homosexuality is wrong. How do we know those things are, are, are wrong? Well, God's Word tells us those things are forbidden. The bottom line is this. Where, is, where there's a clear teaching in the Bible of what we should do or should not do, we are not to question it or try to get around it. We're just to obey it. Period. Man, I mean, the, 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 word, the Word of God is the will of God. When God gives you yea or nay in a certain area, uh, we're to go by that. Second thing we see here, are, we, are there any other biblical principles that can be of help? And that's what I kind of want to share with you tonight. These biblical principles that can help you uh, determine that, that maybe it's not real clear, um, and here's some things. First of all, ask yourself the question, what would Jesus do? Good question, right? We know the character of Jesus, don't we? Um, we have a clear idea from Scripture of the kind of person Jesus is. We know that Jesus put others ahead of Himself. That's that agape love stuff, you know? That the love that seeks the highest good for the other, not, not for, for self. Jesus was humble, not self-serving. Jesus came to serve and not to be served. Jesus sought the kingdom of God first. I mean, these are just some things that we find from Scripture. Uh, look at Ephesians 5 there, verse number 1 and 2. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, 
and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Um, look over, uh, flip over to your right a couple of pages to Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians 2 and verse number 5. Philippians 2 verse 5. Paul says here, says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So we know that Jesus humbled himself before his heavenly Father to do the Father's will. What do you think we ought to do? Humble ourselves before God to do God's will? I think so. First Peter 2.21 tells us, For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. So we have a clear idea uh, uh, from Scripture of the kind of person Jesus is. Not only that, the, the very character of Jesus, the kind of person he was, and the life that he lived are, are bound to be of help to us as we decide what we ought to do. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't take a lot of thought uh, to, to put, kick that into gear. We can observe Christ from the Scripture. In fact, that's what we're doing on Sunday mornings again as we're back in the Gospel of John. We're looking at, at, at uh, Jesus' life as he uh, is now just, just before going to Calvary. And we can see a lot of characteristics in his life that can help in his life that can help us. The second thing here, ask yourself the question, to what is my heart attached? In Matthew 22 and verse 37, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great, great commandment. So here are a couple of things here. Does God have first place? at all times in your life. The worldly person has a heart that is not totally committed to God, but rather attached to something else. And in fact, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So, tell me where your treasure is, I'll tell you where your heart is. That's basically what the Bible is saying. If you, if you, if you can understand where your treasure is at, you can understand the condition of your heart. Um, to love something else more than God, it doesn't, doesn't matter how good or laudable it may be, it's worldliness. And the world is the way it is because it always puts something ahead of God. God wants to be first. He deserves to be first. Paul's admonition for believers was for them to present their bodies as a living sacrifice. Remember Romans 12, chapter, uh, chapter Chapter number 12, verse number 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not only that, he, uh, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20, that our body is the temple of the living God. Where we go, listen, where we go, we take God with us. you got the Holy Spirit living in the side if you're saved. That ought to, that ought to uh, make you think about, do I need to be in this place where I'm going? You know, because we take God with us. The things that we are involved in as believers are done with God inside of us. And it, you know what it does? It, it uh, grieves the Holy Spirit of God when we are uh, are, are involved in activities that are not pleasing to Him. In John 21, verse number 15, we find another example of the commitment that Christ desires. John 21, 15 is when it was... I'm not asking you to turn over there. I'm just going to read one verse from there. But this, after Jesus was resurrected, and remember Peter said, I go, I go fishing, and he went fishing, and uh, uh, others went with him, and then Jesus shows up on the scene, and uh, begins to question Peter about uh, uh, his what he is doing, you know, and uh, encouraging him. He said, uh, "Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these?" In John twenty one fifteen. 
And you know, there's a big uh, debate about what was Jesus referring to. What was what was the these there? Lovest thou me more than these? But you know, the answer to that question is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what these is. If Simon loved anything more than Jesus, he was loving the wrong thing first, right? Um, is there anything or anyone that you love more than Jesus? Commitment to the person of Jesus, which is primary, must be followed by the outworking of that commitment in the drama of our everyday life. You might call it the, in the nitty-gritty decisions, right? Um, a third thing here, C. Ask yourself the question, what is the spirit or the atmosphere of the thing? Again, we refer here to Ephesians 5, look at verse number 11, tells us, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.22 tells us to abstain from all appearance of evil. Uh, there are places the believer should not go and things he should not do because the atmosphere is not conducive to maintaining a Christian witness and or our personal development as a child of God. It's going to affect your walk with God. Romans 13, verse number 12, tells us to cast off the works of darkness. Amen? I mean, darkness was where we used to live before we got saved. Now we are in the light. We, 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 are, we are people of light because the light of Christ is shined in our lives. We need to look at things honestly through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that to avoid all contact with evil is impossible. But to conform to evil or be ac accomplice to evil is to partake of its spirit or atmosphere. We're to have the idea of love not the world, as 1 John 2.15 tells us. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Um, ask yourself the question, number D here, uh, letter D. Ask yourself the question, will this help or harm my Christian life and walk? Now, flip back to Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse 22 and 23. See, I told you, if you stay right there in Ephesians 5, we'd be easy access to a lot of these. But Ephesians 4 and verse number 22 and 23 talks about putting off the old man. Look at verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, talking about our old behavior before we got saved. It says, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Uh, and, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So, you know, uh, the things that we're doing, will they, will they help or harm our Christian life and walk? If it's going to harm our Christian life by producing wrong thoughts or wrong actions, we should avoid it. I mean, this goes to what books should I read? What TV program should I watch? What movie should I watch? What kind of recreation should I participate in? Even, you know, stuff such as that. If it will draw us away from Christian growth by interfering with our church attendance or, or a Christian service, then we should avoid it. I've known uh, people who uh, uh, got involved in something. They did, tried to determine whether they should move to a certain city and and to get a job, I said, well, have you checked out to see whether there's a good church for you to have your family in? No, there's no churches in the area. But God's not in it. <laughs> not unless you plan on going and planting one there. You, know, you plan on going and planting one? I uh, no, didn't think I was going to plant one. Well, my advice would be, God's not in that. I don't care how much money they offer you. Um, Taking a job where there's no church or taking a job that pulls you away from your commitment to Christ, doing something that hurts your Christian walk, those things, it ought to be a given. Hey, this is not good for me. If it's going to hurt my Christian walk, it's going to hurt my ability to be what I ought to be for the Lord. Several questions related to this that we should consider. Can you ask God to bless it? Can you thank God for it? 
Yeah, Colossians 3.17 Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You ought to memorize that. And you ought to memorize 1 Corinthians 10.31 Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Because that'll, that'll fix about 90, 99% of those questions that you got. Really will. Can, can we ask God to bless it? Can we thank God for it? Can we do it to the glory of God? And will, will this be a weight uh, or a hindrance to my Christian life? Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which did so easily beset us. Letter E. Ask yourself the question, How will my doing this influence and affect others? You know, Romans 14 verse number 7 says, None of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. All of life is interrelated. Our choices affect not only ourselves, but our choices can affect our spouse, they can affect our children, can affect our parents, can affect our friends, and even can affect our church. Um, therefore, we must consider how our decisions might affect a variety of people. If we fail to do so, we can ruin our testimony. There may be things that maybe they're not harmful, but they might be a stumbling block to others who are weaker. Several passages of Scripture about this, 1 Corinthians 8 and 9 says, But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. We're not to be a stumbling block to others. We are to be, be an example, and we can't, we can't enjoy the luxury of doing only that which pleases ourselves. In fact, Philippians 2, verse number 4 tells us, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We're to look out for one another. Amen? Look out for you, you're to look out for me. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. What are we to do as uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm, I'm looked and to be involved in the things which edify you. And that works both ways. We're to edify one another. That's why we were given uh, the gifts of the Spirit. It's, it's to edify the church. Build up. That's what the word edify means. Um, letter F. Ask yourself the question, could this become a habit or could it be something that tries to take control of me? In 1 Corinthians 6, 12, Paul said, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. In other words, he, he didn't want something to become a habit or something that would try to control his life. Look at G there. Ask yourself the question, what would I think if I found out my pastor and or his family were doing this? You know, some people have a double standard. Now, they think that it's all right for them, but they sure wouldn't want their pastor or the pastor's wife or the pastor's family to be doing involved in that. Well, can, can I tell you that uh, there are no double standards of righteousness? If it would be questionable for the pastor and his family, that means it's questionable for you too. Yeah. Right. Um, abstain from all appearance of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 And uh, ask yourself the question, is this something I would want to be doing when Christ comes again? You know, the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. And you know, if you're involved in something, and, uh, and at least this question, boy, and the question pops in your mind, man, what if Jesus was to come right now? Boy, I'd be in a heap of trouble. Yeah, you would be. <laughs> if that thought pops into your head. A lot of times we don't even think about it. But we don't know when He's coming, do we? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 tells us, let us watch and be sober. Uh, watch and be sober. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, going to be doing something we're not going to be ashamed of when Christ comes. And then uh, when, when all else fails... Letter I there. Ask yourself the question, do I have doubts about doing this? If so, 
Let me encourage you, don't do it. If you got doubts, don't do it. Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin, according to Scripture. Romans 14, 23. In fact, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 tells us where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Yeah, liberty. Liberty to do it. And so if you've got a question about it, it don't sound like liberty to me. You know, I really don't know if I need to be doing this. Well, if you don't really know, don't do it. <laughs> if there is constraint in the conscience and a sense of uneasiness in the heart, stop right there. Don't let it go any further. A good conscience is a free conscience. Amen? And uh, after the Bible has been read and prayer has been offered and consultation given, and the soul is searched and you still have no peace, well, you need to just leave that alone. <laughs> Just need to leave it alone. They're just some. These are just some guidelines. I hope they'll be a help to you. Um, I got these a long time ago, and most every Bible I have, I, I've got I've got them listed inside the Bible in the leaves of my Bibles, just to remind me of these guidelines, just so I will have them for myself. Because I'm, sometimes I'm like. I'm like you, sometimes I don't have a really very good memory. That's the reason I give you a handout. And uh, I trust it will be a help to you. So how are you doing in discerning the will of God in your life? Can you see how absolutely vital studying God's Word is? I mean, the things, the principles that we've shared tonight are principles that come from the Word of God. Principles that the Holy Spirit can take and, and stir your heart. And maybe, uh, maybe something you're involved in, he'll stir your heart and say, ooh, you really don't need to be involved in that anymore. He said, like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm giving that up. And the, the Holy Spirit's quickened me in that area. Be in the Word like you ought to be. Principles for right decisions come from the Word of God. And we need to get in there and learn God's principles so that we can apply God's principles in our life. Amen. I trust it's a help to you. Um, we're going to have the invitation tonight. Uh, you know, the main biblical exhortation that we have as just human beings is to come to the Lord for salvation. We need the Lord. Let me give you an opportunity if, uh, if somebody realizes they're not saved tonight, come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. But maybe the Lord's quickening your heart in some area tonight or something that you're involved in. Why don't you take take the matter to the Lord in prayer? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you tonight uh, for your word. And Lord, we get these principles. These principles I've shared tonight are principles from having studied the word and uh, from listening to others. And Lord, uh, these come from from uh, uh, the principles that are simply laid out for us, which can be a help to us as your children. And Lord, I pray tonight, if there's one here tonight that doesn't know Christ, pray that they come to a saving knowledge of Christ. But Lord, if there's somebody that's not, and, and maybe they're just not living right, not, they, they know they're not where they ought to be at. Lord, help us to not uh, uh, stay there. Help us to get our lives turned around, get back in the right direction. Lord, give up, be willing to give up the things that we know we need to give up and get involved in the things we know we need to get involved in. Uh, because you're coming back soon. And Lord, we, we'll be glad that we put off those things that uh, you've shown us that we need to put off. We'll be glad we put them off. And we'll be glad that we've embraced those things that you have told us that you want us involved in. We'll be glad when you come that we have listened to your word and we've involved ourselves in those things. Just have your way in the invitation tonight, we pray in Jesus' name.